Hey Adam, how's it going? Hi, how are you? Good, thank you. It's good to see you. Um, and I already apologize for my Darth Vader voice. Uh, I can't help it today. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, you got cold or something? Yeah, yeah, uh, just a cold. I guess it's good we're remote uh, in this case as well. <laughs> All right, should we just start? I mean, um, you put some, I think those are carryovers from the last time when, when I had to cancel. Um, yeah, yeah. So the first one, um, so I already seen two uh, code uh, reviews about this one. So it was always uh, creating a join table like thing, but putting extra columns in it. And, and basically the record itself didn't make sense to be queried by the primary key. It was always queried by two foreign keys. And in that case, the question is, should we always suggest to, to remove the primary key because it's simply absolutely not needed? And that's the question. Yeah, um, so good question. I, I always, I think I always recommend only keeping what we actually need. Um, and I remember, remember some of the issues where we actually decided to drop the, the primary key because it wasn't needed. Um, I think that, that worked fairly well in the past, although I had people say that, oh, no, you, you always want to have an ID column in Rails, but I think that's not, not always true. Um, so, uh, yeah, my take on this is, yeah, we can, we can remove what we don't need. Um, there is one caveat um, that is... Uh, usually, if you if you're in that situation, you would basically create a compound index, a comp composite index um, on the on the unique um, con or for the unique columns, um, and basically make that your primary key. Um, in Rails, currently, you can't do that because you can't have um, composite keys for co sorry composite indexes for primary keys. Um, that might change when we do uh, structure SQL, though, where we have more more freedom of what we what we create. So um, that may not even be an issue anymore. Yeah, uh, about the rest defaults, so similar things comes up, you know, when uh, we had always this uh, default timestamp columns. In some cases, it's absolutely unnecessary. And uh, mm -hmm. I usually suggest to remove them if, if it's not used at all, because I mean, timestamps are, are taking up quite a lot of space. And if there is no use in it, there is no point writing it on the disk. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, we should know what we need. Um, and sometimes you can argue that it's it's helpful to have timestamps uh, in, in retrospect when you do some kind of analysis. Um, but then we, we know that we need that for analysis later. Uh, so that's also a good, good reason to keep them. Um, if we don't, then I don't see a reason of keeping them. Any other opinions on that? Cool, and shall we move on to weird planner behavior? I just looked at that. Yeah, I was surprised that uh, actually if you do a, a double join, then uh, it significantly affects the, the performance of the, of the query. And I noticed that you, you had a suggestion to, to, to put the, the filter of the IDs on the, on the first join on label links. And actually, that's what I did originally, and I put it actually in on the join condition, and it was significantly faster. But then I realized mm -hmm. it's just <laughs> I can just join one table, and and it's it's performant enough. So it's uh it's interesting. Uh, I think we have a few cases when this can actually actually speed things up uh, uh, significantly because we can basically save one join. Yeah, I think in this case you you actually have the uh, the label IDs at hand, right? So, um, and this is why you yes. don't have to join the other table because you already have them. Um, when I looked at it, I thought it was you may want to do the join because you may not be sure that those label IDs already exist. But given that we have the foreign key constraints to them, um, I don't see any difference really. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, 
what was kind of interesting was uh, to look at the um, at these two uh, query plans. I can, I can share my screen. Um, Mm, apparently, I can't share my screen. That's odd. <laughs> Give me a second. <laughs> I had the exact same thing with uh, i3 not so long ago. Um, where you basically see a blank screen when you share something? Yeah. Oh, OK. Um, uh, <laughs> I have to look up the fix. <laughs> I'd be interested, obviously, in knowing. Uh, so no, I can't share my screen. Um, <laughs> Just you have to upgrade i3. You know, I had the same issue. Huh. Okay. <laughs> I should get to that. Uh, i3 has a bug there in the um, Zoom, which Zoom touches in the API. Yeah, you can run xcomp r or something, but uh, then you have to install it and stuff like that. Then, but you don't need to uh, upgrade i3 then. Right. Cool. I'll look into that later. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so yeah, I was basically wanting to. Sh I wanted to show the the query plans for for both of them. Um, <clears throat> they are they are linked in the in the snippet. Um, there's basically two queries in the snippet. Um, first one is rather rather straightforward. We have we have a join and there is two index scans and uh, we can basically push all those conditions down to the to the index. But as as Adam pointed out, as soon as we as we do the third join, then uh, things are, are much worse. Um, where and I think it it totally makes sense for that for the second plan. Um, if you look at this, there is a there is a nested loop inside, and then we do another nested loop on top of that. And um, there is what the planner is basically trying to do is um, picking for the outside nested loop picking. Um, it's got, it's only it's only ever going to retrieve one record for the uh, um, the outer um, um, relation, so it's it's always going to go to the primary key and then um, retrieve that. So I think that sort of explains why it's not picking up any of the other index sets because it just expects it to be uh, one record coming back from that. Um, yeah, but like you said, Adam, I think it's. Um, Always worth removing the joints that you don't need, and when you have that, um, those IDs handy already, then uh, that's a good way of doing it. All right, I just I wanted to. Uh, point out two other things that sort of happened yesterday. They kept entertaining us for quite a bit with the uh, incident in the afternoon. Um, and uh, one of them was intro, the the main reason why why we ran into this issue was um, basically a very large query that was that was executed. Um, and it's it's quite interesting to to look at that I think because uh, we're actually trying to do the right thing here. Um, I, I pasted a screenshot of the code in the document where we where we basically batch what we retrieve. Um, so that's good. So we we're not going to like uh, attempt to retrieve a very large data set from the database um, as usual or as you as you should. Um, but the problem actually lies in the fact that we have, haven't had any um, control over the size of the OIDs array. So um, what actually happened was that the, that we had like an array of uh, 30 or 40,000 OIDs um, from alleged uh, import in that case. So that was, that was totally uh, fine. And then we put that in this query. And as soon as we do the call to any, that sort of translates into a query that has um, 30 or 40,000 OIDs. Um, and um, that basically translated into uh, queries um, stalling or even Postgres backends uh, stalling for 
while they basically try to pass that query because it's so large. Um, and then ultimately, I think we were um, at least part partially also seeing uh, statement timeouts from that. Um, but yeah, um, so the issue is that we don't we don't break down this uh, array when we when we run that query. And I just wanted to uh, point out again that we um, it's it sort of goes in the same direction as um, input validation in a sense. Uh, where you we try to sanitize stuff that's that's not that's beyond our control, um, and in this case we should be also thinking about the size of the of the textual size of the query that that we're that we're running, and that immediately immediately should fix the problem. Um, similar issue, although not not as uh, bad, was in the uh, merge requests uh, feature where where we do similar things with when you push a large uh, when you have a large push with a lot of commits, we basically store all those commit jars in in the query. Or and then you have the same issue that you don't control the the amount of um, shards that comes in. Can you think of any other places where we do thing, similar things that we can prevent from happening? Um, yeah, there was one feature where I was working on upsetting. Uh, file names from the repository, so, call, so to call like some kind of usage statistics, but we, because of similar reasons, we decided not to <laughs> continue mm -hmm. that feature. So, uh, but I don't think any, cannot think anything that's currently in production that, that's doing this kinds of behavior. Is there a way to, to maybe detect this? Uh, somehow maybe have uh, measured uh, the, the size of the database query and have some kind of uh, metrics out of it? It's a good question. So uh, detected during testing, right? Well, yeah, in testing, it's, it's not always possible because usually you work on a small data set. Mm. But uh, it would be nice to see maybe on, on Canary even on production, just to have a, some kind of stats about this. Yeah, we could even, like considering that yesterday's problem basically impacted the whole site. So, um, and this was because we had, so we had these backends stalling for, for those queries. Um, so that was not limited to, to one project or so it, it affected the whole site. So if we had, Thinking if we had like a mechanic that would detect a large query, like if you if you in in Rails, so if you attempted to do like oh send this like two megabytes worth of a query, uh, we may not we may just bail out and say like oh you're doing it wrong um, instead of attempting to yeah, do it. And it's mostly you know an array operation, so you can somehow hook into the the where statement and 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 look at the array what's passed in, and then you have a really good chance of catching this. It must be towards the end of that, though, because we, you know, we 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 separate the query from from the data that we pass in. So, but at some point you have to assemble that, unless you uh, really use prepared statements. Yeah, that's a good idea. On the other hand, there might be situations where where you where it's actually okay to yeah, but you shouldn't be passing like megabytes of a query into the database. That probably doesn't make sense ever. Yeah, I mean, if you, I think we can just put some kind of limit on the the amount of items we we pass in if it's an array uh, query. So that's because I can imagine a situation where we query for a huge blob field, maybe. It's unlikely, but might happen. And probably you don't want to block that. Mm -hmm. 
Makes me wonder if there is a setting in Postgres, but I haven't haven't seen that uh, where you can basically limit the the size of a query. I mean, Postgres client should have a you know a limit size for the query action. Um, I don't remember it. I will check. Um, Right. Any other thoughts? Mm. The other um, thing that would help us a lot yesterday was um, is something that is actually in progress uh, with a community contribution, which is really cool, um, where we can use a gem um, to basically annotate the SQL queries with where they come from. Um, so basically, when you what the problem we had yesterday was uh, we realized that oh, there is this large query that is basically blocking the backends. Um, but where is it coming from? So and then you 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 don't even have a lot of indicators in this case. It was just you know select from LFS objects where a huge list of um, OIDs and nothing else. Um, and then there's this gem marginalia uh, where you basically have, you send the query over with a comment um, and then there is a, you know, reference to the line of code where, where this originates from. And then this is also something it's, you, you can see in the, in the Postgres log. And then you have an immediate uh, reference point where you, where you can look at the code and say like, this is where the query is coming from. Really helpful. And it's a community com contribution, and the the author was planning to send an MR this week, I think. Um, well, that's that's really cool. Cool. Well, anything else we can jump on, or any other topics, or how are the reviews going for for you? For who? Sorry. I was wondering um, how the um, how the database reviews are are going. If you have any like feedback or. Anything that stands out? Do you do you actually get reviews to do? Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, so I just had one today about um, so adding a new index to to the deployments table uh, on the updated uh, timestamp field, and yeah, I was just uh, suggesting to include the project ID because it's they always query it together, mm -hmm. uh, and that actually had finally the database lab is back in, it's working again, so. I was able to verify. Uh, yeah, but I'm getting constantly reviews, so. Great. Um, actually, uh, about database lab, I think somebody else asked uh, what the difference is between the database lab and, and production and the, the seeing different execution times. And uh, Nick pointed out that uh, the database lab instance, it's rather small compared to production, or at least that it has much less memory. Um, so it doesn't always translate to the same execution time, but you can, I, I like to think of it as a way just to detect if you can actually improve a query. Um, so no, not as absolute run times, but as more as relative to what you did earlier on the on database lab um, to understand if there was any any improvement. And I guess uh, it's not always in uh, the stuff is not always in the cache, right? So I usually figure out that yeah, I have to execute the query twice to to have mm. like a, a similar reading that the production database gives. But 
it's really useful because uh, I already pointed out to a few few people that hey, you can also do some basic data migration as well. If you if you write your query in a way, you can also play with uh, with the index. You can create your own index there. So it's really useful. Mm -hmm. I don't know what technology is behind it. Is it like a, a custom session or like a really long running transaction? But it's it's really cool. And it's actually set of us be beyond the. Uh... Uh, on, on that system. So um, Nick built all of this, so I can't go into a lot of details, but what I know is um, that we basically keep a Postgres instance running that keeps uh, keeps itself up to date with production um, through a replication mechanic. Um, and then when you create a session, what basically happens under the hoods is uh, we create a set of S clone or from a snapshot um, for your own session and we basically promote the, so we start a, another Postgres cluster on the same system. Um, we promote that read write so you can actually, um, you know, create indexes or whatever you want to do. And then you, you have your own, you, re, you really have your own cluster you can mess with basically. Um, and when you're done, we just destroy it and, and um, repeat. Um, it's a very cool use of ZFS, I think. Um, but it's it's also underlines the fact that you you never have anything cached basically um, because of that. Andreas, can I assume the number of roles I see that are currently what's in production? Uh, yes, to some extent. I think uh, Nick also pointed out recently that there was there is an issue with the replication mechanic that we have currently. So this may lag a few days or so. Um, once we fix that, and um, we should fix that, um, it should always be very close to production, like in the order of minutes. Um, but basically, what you what you can see is as row counts. That is that is what you can expect in production too. Cool. Well, if we don't have more topics, I still have time, but um, I'm not going to steal your time. So, um, sorry, I just uh, realized I have a question about uh, sure. maybe you remember a week ago, two weeks ago, we had a, a small issue about uh, dropping a table that had a foreign key definition on the projects table and the drop table statement always timed up. And I created an issue out of it to document how do we deal with this uh, during reviews because it, it looks like we cannot just, but there are some conditions, uh, you cannot just drop a table that has a foreign key uh, specification on a high world, high traffic table. Mm -hmm. So, and from the comments, I can see that we cannot really find a, a, a way to actually drop this table. So we need, a, we need to somehow document this, what to do in this case, like a, a, a downtime should be requested or just keep the table as it is truncated. To me, that looks the safest option because there are no records. So I guess the foreign key uh, maintenance is, 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 is zero. There is no much overhead of, of having an empty table around. Yeah, it's sort of mind blowing if you think about it that you you can't drop an empty table because of that. Um, and I, I don't see, I don't have any other idea other than, than what you already said about, about like keeping a graveyard of tables that are sort of empty um, and you keep them around until you have a chance to, to drop them. Although, unless we actually do have a town time, uh, we don't have, we, we never have a chance of, of doing that. Um, yeah, I, I went deep into research, like four hours, uh, thinking multiple ways how to cope with that. You know, uh, there's no way actually. It's just, I think, uh, using this advanced instance setting of downtime, you know, you can keep those uh, tables uh, 
in the database until some uh, admin makes a maintenance. That's the only way, unfortunately. I searched for all smart ways to, you know, to do it. It's like, there's no way, and no trick, nothing. Mm -hmm. well, Unless I think someone comes up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I think we never have had any, any downtime in the last um, at least one and a half years. Uh, not, not obviously we had downtimes, but you know, no planned downtimes for, for migrations. So I've never seen a migration that says, oh, this needs a downtime. Um, I had an idea about uh, we could maybe recycle them because rename table actually works. You can drop columns, except the project ID, of course. So if you need an additional table for your feature that, <laughs> that needs a foreign key to the projects, then you could reuse it. So we could maybe internally recycle it, but that adds a bit of reviewer overhead from, from our side. But at least uh, it wouldn't lay around there empty. <laughs> yeah, an interesting idea, uh, but yeah. But it requires a you know, review process attitude, which is hard to keep in the current now develop yeah. flat development space. I think it's harder to do than keeping them in the trash, like renaming yeah. them to trash and then keeping them forever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean if myself if I'm if I'm creating a table, I will definitely consider maybe we can just get away with it, but I probably wouldn't propose it to to a, for a random review to to use the table because that's just extra overhead for the for the developer. Yeah, I don't, uh, what I researched is, you know, uh, theoretically, if it makes sense, we could open an issue to Postgres upstream. So I searched why it is needed, you know, uh, to, to, you know, to it, and it's needed at the end uh, when you go deep in the Postgres development uh, circles, you will see that it's needed. But we can check and, and open an upstream issue to Postgres if you wish. Like we can track it and ask their own, you know, ideas how to cope with such a thing. I think that's, that could just give us time to make more research with the Postgres core developers. Mm -hmm. that, that's definitely valuable doing, I think. Um, it's also something that is not, you know, pressing, but it's something that is interesting to find out. And, um, there are quite a few people that, that are affected by this. So we're not, we're not the only ones trying to do, delete tables or. We may have a chance though, um, when we, when we do upgrades, uh, upgrades on GitLab.com, um, we haven't, we haven't yet figured out if we want to go the no downtime upgrade route or if we just say like we accept a 30 minutes downtime for, for upgrading Postgres. Um, so that might be a chance of, of doing that, but those are also rare. So we may not, we may not want to rely on them. I mean, uh, requesting downtime just to remove empty tables is like a bad business case. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, Adam, you mentioned you were working on uh, documenting this. Would you mind dropping an yeah. MR link to the agenda? Yeah, I already did. It's an issue, oh, and, and I'm just going yeah. to I'm just going to prepare uh, an MR in the in the docs. Perfect. Thank you. Or maybe something completely else. Uh, in case you're interested, we um, we had this survey about the database training um, maybe last week or a week before, um, and we got good feedback from that. And uh, we're currently reaching out to uh, a few vendors for Postgres training, um, like three or four companies. Uh, Craig reached out to. 
and we're waiting for feedback from them. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to schedule the training uh, quite soon. Is this something we want to open for the whole company or it's mostly for, for database reviews? Um, I think it's it should be open to the whole company. Um, and that was also the intent from the survey. I think that, that went on to the whole engineering department. Um, and I think we got feedback for from, um, if I remember that, 30 or 35 uh, people interested in, in the training. Um, the, I think the problem or the, what, what I'm not sure about is, is if, we, if we're actually going to have somebody that is fluent in both uh, Rails and Postgres um, to, to run the training. Um, so that's a bit of a challenge. Um, but what is what is readily available is uh, things like um, performance, the Postgres performance training. So without the Rails aspect to it, but uh, diving into the Postgres uh, performance issues. And there is lots of companies doing that. We just have to find a, a good one that is that is also offering that in a remote setting. Um, I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> Cool, yeah, there's lots of topics to cover. Um, also, if you ever get the chance to go to any of the Postgres conferences, there's, there's always a um, training session uh, around the conference or in the day before, and I highly recommend those as well. Um, they, they're usually run by, by Postgres committers, um, and they really know what they're talking about, so pretty good to attend. All right, should we wrap it up for today? All right. Bye, everyone. Have a nice day. Uh, Have a nice day. Everybody. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.